Are we on? And we are, I don't believe we're on. I'm saying, yeah, we are on. Yes. All right, cool. All right. Um, hello, Matt. How are you? Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine, but how are you? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, dodging the question. I'm uh, I'm I'm well. I'm well. I'm just I'm just a little a little uh, under the um, sleep deprivation. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So I'll go easy on you then. Have <laughs> mercy. Have mercy. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know, um, uh, these discussions in in which we engage and 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 I'm so glad that. Uh, you know, to be doing this and, and fortunate not just to uh, find myself in uh, what's the fancy word interlocution yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, with you, but also uh, engaged and engaging uh, other folks that participate. Um, I am, uh, I am equally, uh, you know, and certainly often more challenged uh, than, uh, than I can muster. In, in my own challenges to others. So uh, very fortunate to uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, over the, the various a number of weeks that we've been working together on this project. Very fortunate to find myself in your company. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone else too that, you know, uh, contributes to, to the discussions. Uh, it's so uh, uh, important to the uh, production of a community, uh, uh, that is a certainly valuable, uh, and then adding, uh, you know, to use the, the language of this book, adding to the value of, of, of understandings as far as this book is concerned. Matt, I am a simple man. <laughs> uh, all right. Man, um, however, however much I am in pursuit of uh, literary. Uh, and and dialogical craft, Matt. And so, um, given the simplicity, given my sincerities, <laughs> and given my honesty, Matt, uh, I must tell you that I will try to bait you in a particular kind of conversation. Um, um, You're going easy on me. <laughs> All right, there we go. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> wake me up! Wake me up! All right, let's go. <laughs> All right, here you go. But did you get your coffee today? Do you have your? Do you have today's coffee? I I I, I, I just woke up. So I'm. You know what? I'm gonna. Oh, oh wow! But what, okay. we're gonna like. We're gonna walk around this. We're gonna do a. Uh, All right, All go, right. go go. Well, we're gonna we're gonna multitask here. Right. Watch the reproduction of the work right now. I'm gonna make some coffee. Yeah. For my own social reproduction. <laughs> Exactly. It's so true. It's so true, you know. Um, uh, here goes. I want to. Um, I want to read an excerpt from uh, something. Uh, outside of capital, written by Marx, uh, and then of course we'll begin discussion about you know chapter five or in and around chapter five, uh, and it's from it's from Marx's uh, response to the philosophy of poverty, what Marx called the poverty of philosophy. I think you might see. Uh, where I'm headed with this, I told you I I haven't mastered the craft uh, just yet, but I you know my assumption is that you know uh, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, the productive forces. This is from a quote. Uh, the productive forces are therefore the result of practical human energy. But this energy is itself conditioned by the circumstances in which men, and I will add women, find themselves by the productive forces already acquired, by the social form which exists before they do. Let me right, let me repeat that. By the social form which exists before they do. 
which they do not create, which is the product of the preceding generation. And then I'll advance a little bit here and say, uh, in quote, with the acquisition of new productive facilities, men change their mode of production. Men and women change their mode of production. And with the mode of production, all the economic relations, which are merely the necessary relations of this particular mode of production. Um, <laughs> there's, there's other things that, you know, um, I'd like to read about this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna forego that for the moment. And um, basically, what I'm going to do uh, is ask uh, to speak to something um, often misrecognized uh, as as things are uh, when people are discussing things, and when they sound right, they appear to be logical. Uh, and then uh, they build, uh, if you will, castles uh, on the beach, you know, uh, uh, based on based on on logic alone. Um, in other words, uh, and I know exactly that you know where it is I'm headed because there's a particular term, um, uh, poor as the term um, uh, is, you know, to be woke. Right, uh, that that merits uh, attention here, um, and what what Marx is essentially doing here in this particular quote, uh, here in in, in this uh, quote from a book called or from a, from a, from a manuscript called uh, the Poverty of Philosophy is what he's doing is that he's underscoring the primacy of material conditions in history, however recognized or misrecognized these. These conductions, I'm sorry. These these constructions be, uh, Matt. Uh, before we get into the contradictions of uh, uh, capitalist relations, and before we get into an understanding of how very practical, uh, though often misrecognized, forces bear on the construction of surplus value uh let's set the stage for that discussion let's talk about the uh, poverty of philosophy more generally and and the poverty of a uh shall i say a chicana and chicano um, um a narrow chicana and chicano philosophy uh, yeah well, okay, so so I think it's really important for, to to understand that, like what what Marsh was describing earlier in the quote you mentioned, was he's talking yeah. about a world wherein you know, like that you're born into, right? That, that these things are you're 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 born into cycles of reproduction that you're not aware of. You're not aware of their genesis. You're not aware of these things. You're caught up in them, right? And they they independent of your will and most assuredly independent of your consciousness. You are caught up in these cycles, right? They keep going and going and going and going and going and going. And I think that's why, you know, we started. We we began uh, our reading in the end with with the beginnings of primitive accumulation. So we began at the, be even though it's in the end of the book, it's the beginning. It's the it's it's where from whence all these things come, right? Because we don't want to be like that worker caught in these cycles that we have no idea how they began. Otherwise, we're just lost in the the analysis of the world around us without an understanding of where that genesis point is, right? And I think that in, in the United States of America, oftentimes when we talk about social struggles, we always try to find a genesis point. We always try to say, okay, it was the slaughter of the Indians. It was the enslavement of Africans. And then you get into like different groups of people. You're like, okay, it begins for us, it begins with the Mexican-American War. For others, it begins with the Chinese Exclusion Act. For this, this, we're always like trying to find this beginning point to like, from whence do our problems emerge, right? This sort of thing. Now, what oftentimes happens, you know, in poverty philosophy was talking about, and uh, is, is that you know people who are trying to just like philosophically grapple with the world and not actually have any kind of material basis to what they were talking about so this is what he was describing yeah. we see this in our time as well we see this time in our time as well not only with the group of people that we're talking about here the 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 the, the um you know the the the, the, the coin has been termed mocosos right which is a combination of woke and mocoso right and we're not just talking about them i mean i'm not just talking about them because a lot of what the mocosos come out of a lot of what they emerge from is this revulsion which i share 
with these kind of like uh, this group of Marxists or, or, or a group of materialist kind of people who were primarily white and primarily had this class, not race mentality, right? Yeah. Now, that kind of thing, again, it, that's very ahistorical because when we're talking about, when we say class, not race, what you mean to say is that we're all workers and we need to stop talking about racism so much and start talking about this class struggle that we can all participate in, this, this thing we all can participate in. But that negates the Western European conquest of the world. It negates the ordering of peoples on the basis of that thing. It's very ahistorical. I call it ahistorical yeah. materialism, right? You're, you're, you're trying to apply some like kind of like materialist outlook on the world um, and denying the realities of history, denying you're denying history. You're denying the stuff his, uh, uh, materialism is supposed to be based on. The stuff dialectical materialism is supposed to be based on, which is history. You're supposed to base it on history. Historical materialism yeah. is based on history, right? So it's very, very historical. Well, the Wokosos, they're essentially what they are, are, are postmodernists. They're jargonistas. They play a series of word games. They're just connected to each other. Not that different from the class, not racist Marxists. And uh, because they can connect all these word ga games together, they think they've made a point. But again, they are very historical. They don't know anything. They're lazy. They don't want to. They don't want to put things together. They don't want to read. They don't want to learn things. They don't want to place things in historical timelines. They simply want to cherry pick, hear other words that people have said, and 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 and. Connect. So yes, again, this is the, yeah the, the the poverty of of, of Ocosaria is is very very you know the, when I say poverty, I don't mean like people are poor. I mean like the I mean, the way Marx was talking about the poverty of philosophy. Meaning that like people didn't know anything. This is very similar. They don't know anything. They 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 simply don't know anything. They don't know any. They don't even know the things they're objecting to. Like it'd be a lot easier to deal with them if they would like point to historical things and say like, and here's an example of what I'm saying. Here's an example of what I'm saying. Here's an example. They have no examples. They're just they're just. What you know? uh? So um, and so the, the the conflict with them is not a conflict over over groups of people. As they is a is a is a they because they're very anti-Mexican, right? So it's not a it's not a conflict of of Mexicans versus Salvadorans, Mexicans versus Guatemalans, or Mexicans versus you know uh, for lack of a better term, American Indians. Like it's not about that. What it really is is materialist, um, a materialist conception of the world versus whatever I felt this morning, because that is really what they present. And so, like, we really have to fight that. We really have to fight that. And it goes a lot deeper than just them. I mean, this, this, this is just a manifestation of a very, of a much, much deeper thing that's been going on for for a decade now. And and I, I, I kind of hesitate to talk about it because it becomes the kind of a career-ending statement to even like to even point to, you know point it out. But the emperor really has no clothes here. This really goes to like this really the the basis of putting everything around the the centrality, the centrality of this of like trauma and of healing and of the necessity to to heal from these wounds and that everything else needs to circle around that as opposed to finding the genesis of our problem yeah. and striking against it yeah. right so instead we find ourselves in these constantly healing circles and these people aren't licensed therapists they're not trained psychologists they're not really going to help you they're not really going to help you like out without those problems so you know that that's why you know when i formed earlier with a group of others at telehawa our first article written by me was politics are not therapy you know, and, and, and when I said that, is I, and I, it was not a slight against therapy. It was a simple statement that politics are not therapy. And if you want to, um, you know, like, you know, like, you know, going out and like, you know, holding a, a political education, you know, is not going to help you if you broke your arm. No, you need physical therapy. You know what I mean? Like, that's not going to help you. But at the same There's time, a... go ahead, go ahead. At the same time, finding the root of like why you and your sister don't get along is not going to seize the means of production either. So, like, you know, like, that's what therapy is for. Therapy is good. Go to therapy. I'm not saying therapy is bad. Go to therapy. That's good. But that's not politics. Politics are different. Politics are about... There's, there's, there's a term um, with which I became familiar, uh, you know, some years ago uh, as I was um, uh, doing work to master uh, Spanish. Uh, yeah. Spanish, you know... Um, elevated or maybe uh, more sophisticated, more um, uh, diverse uh, uh, grammars in the Spanish language. And I came across a word, the word is tergiversar. And the word seemed very interesting to me. In fact, uh, it has a, a, a cognate uh, in English, which is to uh, tervi, tergiviserate, <laughs> I forget the, um, the actual, uh, translation, but essentially it is not just the 
uh, not just a conversation uh, for conversation's sake, but a conversation that is articulated in order to distract, right? To create a series of branches uh, uh, in uh, the uh, linguistic terrain, if you will, in uh, the lexicon, in discussions that take place in society, uh, such that attention, uh, not just to the principal stem of things and to the principal root of things is, is, uh, is, is ignored, uh, is, is hidden, is occluded, is, you know, is, is kept out of our attention. But as you say, um, uh, so are very particular steps that need to be taken. Of course, uh, I'm, I'm uh, modifying a bit what you had said earlier, uh, but the particular steps that ought to be taken in order to uh, get at the root of things, uh, to get at the principal stem of things, right? These things become uh, lost in the uh, mire of uh, words uh, that are out there. So, um, Having said that, I want to uh, turn turn attention to something, uh, Matt, uh, so that we can uh, think about uh, think about our our exploitation a little more. Um, uh, uh, certainly, in line with with Chapter Five, and of course, the uh, title of Chapter Five that uh, you know uh, that we're discussing today is the contradiction in the general formula of capital and I want to uh, begin discussion uh, today about uh, our uh, incapacities to get at the material conditions of our existence by way of uh, an anecdote, by way of an anecdote uh, um, uh, that goes uh, like this. Uh, as, as a child, uh, I found myself in my father's truck. Uh, I often found myself in my father's truck you know, uh, bored out of my mind in traffic, either on the way to work, you know, on a Saturday morning, on a weekend morning, or on the way home, tired uh, from having worked uh, with my dad, uh, you know, in some construction site. And uh, what aggravated my boredom, <laughs> what aggravated my anxiety, my wish to get home and to eat, <laughs> Matt, was traffic it was traffic and i was as a child i was under the mistaken assumption much as the economist that marx critiques in this particular chapter that traffic was a consequence of the exchanges of space made on the road after work of course you know marx is writing about in this particular chapter, Marx is writing about uh, the market, right? And uh, the exchanges uh, that take place uh, in the market, in a capitalist market, uh, between uh, buyers and sellers. And the uh, fact of the matter, according to Marx, and of course, according to reality, is that uh, that uh, the values that are accrued and the advantages that are made uh, and that are gained for one uh, uh, party over another, right, have much to do with the forces acting upon the market, you know, and that uh, in the scope of the exchange between buyers and sellers are outside of, at least within their perspective, are outside of their particular encounters. And that's where I'm headed to as far as this particular uh, anecdote that I'm sharing. Where, you know, uh, along with my dad, you know, uh, uh, fog up the, the cab of the truck with his cigarette smoke. Uh, anybody who's uh, <laughs> done construction work, you know, and driven on a hot uh, summer uh, uh, late afternoon on their way uh, home from work uh, knows what I'm talking about. 
that uh, as I was writing, the uh, that traffic was a consequence uh, of the exchanges of space. We were I was under the assumption, right, that the speed and our ability to uh, uh, to gain speed to gain speed, of course, and to make space on the road was a consequence of these exchanges. If if people simply uh, surrendered space to one another, things, uh, you know, we'd, we'd all get home much sooner. What I did not recognize was, of course, was, was that the price of space uh, that, re that was regulated, um, uh, the, the price of space that was regulated by forces outside of the freeway or off the road, right? Um, right. Coveted as space and speed uh, on the road was, right? Uh, that that price and the value of space and speed were, uh, of course, regulated by forces um, uh, outside of traffic, uh, were regulated by uh, the gatekeepers of traffic, uh, were regulated by those that set the rules for our engagement. Um, how might how might you suppose uh, we can begin to uh, build on build on my uh, confusion as a, as a child uh, worker about the value uh, of space and and uh, speed and and so forth how might we begin to uh, draw from this anecdote to take to make steps uh, uh, not just in terms of uh, evaluating and assessing the mistaken notions that people have about the world around them, you know, philosophical uh, as these notions might be, but also uh, make subsequent uh, uh, incursions into uh, understandings about the um, the weight of exploitation on the ability uh, for some to uh, extract value you know, from workers. What do you think? Um, uh, does well, this work? I think, I think, I think what, you're talking, what you're describing, what you're describing with the, with the, you know, being a child and viewing traffic is very interesting because, you know, towards the end of this chapter, um, Karl Marx starts talking a lot of, uh, starts talking trash about uh, Benjamin Franklin and, and the mm -hmm. way that Franklin kind of uh, looked at things, right? And he says something to the effect of like Franklin described, uh, um, war is robbery and commerce is generally cheating, right? So like that, that kind of concept of like, you know, that the, the capital is a game and these are capitalists are playing this game. And when we try to understand capital, we can see that like, hey, they're all being dishonest and they're all whatever, right? So Benjamin Franklin offers us this like little piece of cynicism, but it doesn't actually offer, it doesn't really, it doesn't really cut into like, well, how, why are those guys the capitalists and those yeah. people? workers i mean how are they how are they even uh, he's he's starting us in the middle of the story right which is in like this kind of like a palace intrigue kind of thing right this the yeah. the, 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 the the competition between capitalists right and the lying and the cheating and the and the finagling and the thing that like you know for some it's just like look at these dastardly you know like you know criminals and other people it's like oh it's the thrill the hunt it's the it's the climb it's the ladder it's the you know that's the ladder it's the sweet smell of success and they love it right but either way whether you like are revolted by it or whether you enjoy it um it is actually based on being able to uh absorb and accrue and move the labor of millions upon millions of people, yeah. if, even if they are not directly your workers, because the work they do is interconnected to the work that your workers directly do, which make you rich. So, I mean, like you know, the 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 work of, of Rockefeller's workers connects to the work of, of of Carnegie's workers, which allows Carnegie to be Carnegie and Rockefeller to be Rockefeller. Their their the labor that they're both accruing takes place somewhere it takes place in the society right and and in, inside that society, inside that political shell because um there's a political shell that operates for them to do it because they themselves um are kind of the the the, the product that gets produced is they it kind of is interconnected somehow um they are able to be be the billionaires they're able to be they're able to be the things they're able to be carnegie rockefeller um, all these all these individuals at the time, Vanderbilt, all these people, like you know, kind of the dawn of of well, modern capital. 
right? Which goes on to today. So like the Silicon yeah. Valley, right? These people are all interconnected. The Zuckerberg, the, um, you know, um, uh, Elon Musk, uh, et cetera, et cetera, Bezos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're all interconnected. So like they're, they're interconnecting these things that even though they're competitors, they're still locked into to, to a, a political shell that allows them to accrue the wealth of, of, of other people, to accrue the labor of other people and turn into this thing called money. Now, just because they cheat and fight with one another to see who's going to have 72 billion versus who's going to have 34 billion does not mean that they are not, that does not extricate them from the system. Just be like, well, all is folly and all is murder and all is war and all against all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and like kind of, you know, kind of a democratize the blame and shame for the way society is organized. No, 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 no. These people sit upon thrones of blood sweat and tears and we have to really always we, we have to keep that in mind we have to we can't lose sight of that fact just because we see that they themselves are in competition because the minute you start doing that then you should say well they are in competition we as workers are in competition the world is competition this is human nature this is the, the way it world, is the yeah. world is a ghetto yeah exactly you start you start thinking that way right and the reality is that, yeah, you know, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, the world is a ghetto can be interpreted in a couple different ways, but like, but the idea well, that somehow, like, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, it, it, that everything is just a, a knife fight at, at, at one level or another, um, it, it, you know, like, no, not everything's a knife fight. Like, you know, there's knife fights and then there's war, right? You know, what I mean, and 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 people who like pull a knife out of their pocket are not capable of commanding millions of people to go to war, you know what I'm saying? So none of the, the world, you know, the world would be better off if it were just, you know, a series of random knife fights that took place just now and <laughs> most of the world, you know, to find, uh, you know, humanity largely, you know, for the, I don't know, what, a couple thousand years we've been cognizant, um, or we've been able to, like, develop things and develop agriculture and fire and, you know, our, our population expansion and then that time period um it has largely the, the most defining thing has been war and 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 then devising technologies for war it's war and property and so like that kind of thing is uh you know the way in which the way in which uh the way in which the, i don't know the the the, the, the most, imp, most the most defining signature quality that, that people have had and so like but it's not it's not people on an individual level. It's not beating in the hearts of, of individuals. It's not beating in the hearts of, you know, like your your patriarchal asshole uncle. It's not beating, it's not, it's not, it's not Archie Bunker that's doing this. It's 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 it's, it's, it's a it's an entire it's a it's it's society that's structured so that very few people can make these grand decisions that will not affect them. And so uh well, at least it won't, you know, it won't, it, it's not going to end with a bullet in the back of their head, except for, you know, rare occasions, like the Romanovs or, or other glorious moments in history. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. but now I'm, just, I'm going on to a different tangent, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I just uh, want to uh, welcome folks. Um, I want to welcome Karina, Dust, and San uh, to, at least in what I see here, I don't know if you see other other names. All right, I see, uh, I see those. I want to get to. I want to get to Zan's comment maybe later. But can we can we read Karina's comment? Who actually has bearing on 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 what we were talking about earlier? What's that? Will re, Will you repeat that, please? Can we read Karina's comment now because it has kind of bearing to the conversation that we were talking about? Go for it. All right. So it says Tela Hagwar is our answer to the woke politics. So again, Tela Hagwar is a collective of four people. It's not just me. It's uh, okay. me, Karina, Maria, Ernesto. Um, and we all kind of came together during the struggle to for the mention name change, right? Mepigate. All right, so this is kind of, uh, Telehagua is our answer to the surge of woke politics that surfaced over the past couple of years, the kind of politics that focus on endless critique of words, discussion of traumas and feelings, and in, uh, infamous political position that because of a particular identity, identity interrogation, such as telling Mexicans and Chicanos that they are not indigenous, and some people are, some people because of how they define themselves, just have a right to be right, and it cannot be questioned. Much as woke politics also targeted the Chicano movement, and put much emphasis on attempting to dismantle legitimate organizing, education, and material-based analysis. We want to expose and destroy this brand of woke politics. We want to bring content to uh, from a Chicano and Mexicano perspective, which is focused on historical material analysis. At Telahagua, we are going to derive our sense of reality from history and economics, and our sense of direction from La Lucha. Okay. Right. And that is kind of a, um, 
that's kind of the mission statement. I mean, it's a little, it's a, it's, you know, I, I, it's, uh, I think, I think Karina added um, some flair here and some mill parts, but that, that is essentially, essentially like that has been our position. Like this is that, and that, that last part is definitely part of our mission statement. That last sentence, that is, that is who we are. We are, we, we, we derive that, that is collectively, that's not me, that's not her, that, that's something that we as a collective came to. At Tel Ahagwar, we are going to derive our sense of reality from history and economics and our sense of direction from La Lucha. That, and that is really the kernel of what we're doing over there. And it, that, that, that's what we intend to do. We intend to, we intend to, to base our, our, our analysis on history and economics and, and, our, and our drive forward based on the, you know, based on what is, based on the present, you know, based on yeah. what is presently in front of us and, and, uh, and where the fight takes us. Um, but the fact that we are committed to the fight, the fact that we are committed to, to improving the lot of, of our people in the working class and working people across the world in general, um, and, and not just improve the lot, but like actually seize power and, and create, create a world wherein there are not, there's not this distinction of proletariat versus capitalist. There's just no, no such thing exists. There's just people, right? People and people own things, you know, people own things collectively and people own the world they live in, you know, like, and, and, and they own their destinies, you know, and that, that's what we, that's what we're fighting for. And we're, and we're not fighting to sit around and feel bad. And we're not sitting around to make other people feel bad. We're, we're here to like, you know, like to, to, to fight. All right, all right. Um, well then, uh, on the road, <laughs> uh, yeah. on the road to that, of course, uh, and as you mentioned uh, earlier, right, is uh, uh, concerted, thoughtful, and serious contemplation, investigation, and understanding uh, of of the material conditions in which we we find ourselves, and that. Uh, obligates one to uh, understanding uh, our interactions with one another, caught as our interactions are in uh, the market of exchanges. And uh, I want to uh, begin uh, uh, with a quote uh, before uh, we then uh, engage uh, other folks uh, you know, in the Q and A portion of our of our exchange uh, here, uh, Matt, in, in 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 some in some minutes, Marx writes um, on each occasion, and I, he says, uh, maybe I'll begin at the top of the paragraph. Says uh, this inversion has no existence for two out of three persons who transact business businesses uh, together. As capitalist, I buy commodities from A and sell them again to B. But as a simple owner of commodities, I sell them to B and then purchase fresh ones from A. A and B see no difference between the two sets of transactions. They are merely buyers or sellers. And I, on each occasion, meet them as a mere owner of their money, of either money, I'm sorry, or commodities as a buyer or seller. And what is more, in both sets of transactions, I am opposed to A only as a buyer and to B only as a seller. The one only as money, to the other only as commodities, and to neither of them as capital or a capitalist, or as representative of anything that is more than money or commodities, or that can produce any effect beyond what money and commodities can right and i'm thinking <laughs> i'm thinking about uh, uh as as simplistic as i'm trying to make this uh, uh in imagination matt i'm thinking about our uh, encounters uh perhaps not at the supermarket but perhaps at the swap meet right uh where um uh, we are um, you know, we have a facility for negotiating a price on a particular commodity. And so um, we are trying to um, estimate the uh, real value of something and then approximate that value either to, uh, uh, or, or, or rather approximate that value on the basis of, you know, cold hard cash, right? In ways that are advantageous to us, right? So that if I see, a, you know, I see a commodity, in this case, it's a cup, right? And I estimate that value to be, you know, 
uh, X amount. I, and I want this particular cup. I am going to pay, or I'm going to seek to pay less money than this cup contains in value, right? Because as it were, I'm attempting to come up on, on the sale. I'm attempting to come up on the sale. And as confused as a child worker is, you know, on the 710 freeway on his way home from work, about what is around him, uh, so too uh, are some folks uh, when uh, they reduce their encounters with one another to the exchanges that are taking place in the immediate moment because they misrecognize the forces that are acting upon me as the buyer, right, with the money and uh, the uh, person with whom I might find myself in the particular uh, market, uh, the person who has the commodity and is equally trying to come up in this particular transaction. Equally, he's estim he has estimated or she has estimated the value of a particular commodity and is seeking to extract from me more money, more dollar bills, more currency, right? than the value that is contained in this particular commodity. And this is, you know, um, uh, a first level of analysis of our interactions might stop there, might stop, uh, might stop there and, and uh, have an incomplete understanding of the very fact that we find ourselves in a market and that there's a preceding set of circumstances that you know that govern uh, that govern our presence, you yeah. know. So well, you know, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely hear you. I mean, like, I think that, like, you know, the, oftentimes, you know, the I, I, what I like to put is, you know, the world is bigger than the view outside your window, right? Yeah. And like we often don't we often don't know that, and it's kind of it, it, you know sometimes when you get in these political debates with people, they, they they put like some really unrealistic expectations on you, like you know they're saying like okay so this cup da da da, da that well, why are cups valued as they are? Why aren't cups this much? Or why aren't cups so why? And then why do you give the exact price as to why why cups are 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 find themselves in this exact price point range? And the, and, and like and if you don't know that, then you don't know what you're talking about at all, right? Yeah. So I mean, like, if you want to know why cups are what they are, do the research find out like you you know like the, the, the do the investigation like you know you can find the, the, just because i don't have the answer does not mean these questions are not answerable right you know like i don't know why cups are exactly you know three dollars and 26 cents to four dollars and 58 cents i don't know why like you know you have to look, you have to look it up i mean I'm, you can figure, you can figure it out i mean like there's, there's a reason why it's that and not six dollars and why it's not this many right and you start going into like prices that you find unreasonable you're like wait a minute that's ridiculous i'm not paying much i remember one time i saw a glass at um at the dallas art museum and it was like selling for 56 dollars, right and it was just like a glass that was handcrafted and showed the artist it was like you know and it was like it was kind of like it was, it was, it was kind of interesting shape i mean because it went like this it kind of like tilted like that but why was this glass being sold for 56 dollars? i don't know because this guy made it right because you know so maybe somebody could sell it but that's so boutique that, that that's not gonna that's not gonna be something that's gonna be like something that's uh, uh gonna be in the house of every every individual because you know you know, like, cause that's just the new price of glasses. Uh, you know, like th that's not that's not the way it's going to work. Um, that's the new price of a cup. It's fifty six dollars. I mean, that 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 you know, just because like a capitalist is greedy does not mean that that's going to that's not going to work out. You know what I mean? Like, um, so you know, like, the, you know, like I. But but the bigger philosophical point here is that the, is that the world is bigger than the, the view outside your window. That you really need to understand that like there are so many different mitigating factors as to make the world as it is as it appears for you and that what you're looking at is a manifestation of a world way bigger than you can comprehend at any given moment the totality of which you cannot comprehend at any given moment you have to take it piece by piece by piece and try and like make sense of it and um and people don't want to do that people well, i don't want to get in a critique of people but like but 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 it's 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 a it's a difficult thing to do and it's not something i suggest you do all the time like 24 7 because you're just that's not possible but if you really want to understand why the world is as it is or a chunk of it is as it is it has you're, you're looking at the effect of something that you think is the cause but it really actually is is the effect of a higher cause of a more distant cause 
and a further distant cause and a further distant cause and a further distant cause. So, you know, the world is based on kind of cause and effect, but it's it. Uh, um, but oftentimes when you think you're looking at the cause, the genesis, the starting point, it really is actually a reflection of something that happened way before that, that hovers way above that. And so just knowing that and trying to understand that um, as we try to like examine the world around us is, is, is really, really critical. Um, it's, to, to, uh, it's, to knowing what we're talking about. I mean, like I, I see people just like, I don't know, all right, go on. No, well, the thing is that, uh, you know, your observation is 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 well taken. Mm -hmm. In my case, of course, you know uh, the work that I do uh, finds me in conversation constantly with with uh, a variety of people, and and and, um, and so sometimes, of course, when I'm having uh, conversations about uh, the capacity to extract uh, value and build upon. Uh, uh, intellectual encounters that take place in school settings, um, the view that people have out their window, as you put it, is that everything begins at home and that if things changed at home, things would change for students once they left home. And that's a very myopic, um, uh, uh, limited, narrow understanding of uh, the right. uh, function of function of schools as banks, literally as banks of words, right. where some are able to extract uh, uh, price and some are even able to extract value yeah. and then take it to the market and in, in, to different markets. Right, right, right. I, uh, but here's something I want to say, though, like well, in terms of the world outside that, because in tie back to what we were talking about earlier, when we talk about the question of Chicano studies and Chicano like understanding and the Chicano lens of, of understanding uh, the country as a whole, we are deeply, deeply underrepresented, and we become the foot soldiers of our underrepresentation. I know someone who is a very, very intelligent person, and they said something to the effect of, like, I, you know, um, you know, like when I when I was first like learning about things, I kind of learned about, you know, the United States. I learned about like struggles. I learned about, you know, I learned about the Black struggle. I learned about this, and then when I wanted to like, you know, get a bigger expansion, I started learning about international stuff. But I never really learned about the Chicano struggle. I never really learned about this. And this person was born in El Sereno. Right. So they go off to a very fancy school and they learn about, you know, the international struggle. Right. They come back. They finally start engaging with like some of these texts and some of these things, you know, like later, like way too late in life, in my opinion. Um, and not that they're old, but just like, you know, like if they were, if they're going to be engaged in struggle, they should learn this. And I'm not saying that they're, they're through any fault of their own. They should. These things should have been provided. This should have been part of the general understanding, the world around yeah. you. Right. So when I say the world is bigger than the world around you, but it, the world outside your window is also the world. Right. You don't have to, like, go across the world to find a, a side of struggle, right? But that was that was that was something that like this person was denied, the, the, the history of the struggle of the very neighborhood this person lived in, right? Later on, this person becomes one of the worst Mephistas, one of the worst horrible, 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 horrible attitude and horrible attack on Chicano studies, horrible attack on Chicano struggle, horrible, just anti-Chicano kind of, kind of uh, individual, right? Um, and, uh, but here they were, admittedly starting off their life being denied that history and being denied seeing that part of uh that that piece of of humanity in struggle right um as as something significant and then later on go on in adult life to deny the significance of this thing that was never taught to them which they are caught up in whether they like it or not or whether they will admit it or not right so that kind of that that's an interesting thing that's an interesting phenomenon someone i will name is a a, a public outlet uh, called Chicanisma. And this thing, this outlet calls itself Chicanisma, right? But I've never seen a, a, a celebration of, you know, Jovita on there. I've never seen a celebration of, uh, you know, Emma, who organized the, the pecan strike. I've never seen a celebration of any notable Chicanas on there. Um, what I see instead is this, this kind of battering against like this idea of, you know, like the Chicano nationalists are trying to erase and take over this and that and the other, right? Now this person in their own in an interview, I'm not I'm not digging up any personal knowledge, in an interview, described that they were they first got into politics by reading white feminists and then later reading black feminists, but never actually reading um, you know, uh feminists from a Chicano perspective, that, that was came way later. And then yeah. then they actually took the, the phrase from which they took Chicanisma 
they got in a huge argument with that public intellectual, right? And which is basically like you're stealing my ideas and, and your, 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 your product is horrible. And so they started fighting and then she ended up, you know, calling her out and trying to like cancel this, you know, this, this huge li li literary figure. And so, I mean, this is the type of, I mean, this is the type of, of, of the poverty of philosophy as we were discussing, the, 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 just the nonsensical stringing together of just, 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 just horrible, just, just, yeah. just, just yeah. lack, of, lack of any analysis, lack of any scholarship, lack of any like uh, effort. Lack of any reading, lack of any homework, <laughs> just a lack. I mean, like they, they lack, they lack, they lack, they lack, and and, uh, and it's very important to remember that because um, um, we have to we have to fight for a materialist conception of the world, which require which does require you do your homework. It does require yeah. you. Do, it does require that you like figure out what you are talking about before you open your mouth, and you know, like that's just not popular um, at the moment. But it can be repopularized, and all it will take is just a few. Um, a few choice encounters. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that's what, well, well, amongst among those encounters, of course, are are encounters such as the ones that you know we've been uh, uh, articulating over over the last uh, two or three months, uh, yeah. and and um, and it takes time, it takes patience, uh, it takes uh, seriousness, um, and. And it takes up. Uh, it takes a, a willing to be challenged. Uh, uh, it takes a willing to be challenged, uh, and to uh, put old understandings or established understandings uh, under under a new microscope and arrive at uh, perhaps uh, more appropriate and more correct understandings. And and so, having said that, you know, um, there's one last set. Well, there's one last. Uh, observation that I want to make before we uh, engage folks, uh, San, uh, uh, Karina, and uh, Dust, uh, as I can see here on my screen, have have shared some, some things. And, and um, I, I do want to mention, right, that if a surplus value, um, as opposed to profit, right, as opposed to dollar bills, uh, as opposed to currency, be that uh, be that uh, uh, paper currency, um, metallic currency, or digital currency, that surplus value is obtained to the extent that new labor is added to an existing commodity. And from, and from it is made possible, not just a sale from which added money is made as an imprecise and exploitative marker of augmented value, but from the labor value contained in the commodity. What do I mean? What I mean is that be, this is true because workers must sell their commoditized labor for less than its value in a labor market, right? And it's because these things uh, are taking place, bankers regulate the economy. Bankers, if you will, regulate the track of currency. Bankers regulate the interactions that take place. But of course, you know, as you and I are in discussion, Matt, right? Or as I might find myself at the Santa Fe Springs uh, swap meet, at the Paramount swap meet, you know, at the swap meet over off in, in El Monte, et cetera. As I, as I find myself, the bankers are nowhere to be seen. And I might be led to understand that, you know, that they are irrelevant, uh, you know, because of that, any discussion about bankers in these particular moments might seem strange. And Marx is arguing for us to understand, right, that bankers, however misrecognized they are, you know, and capitalists, however misrecognized they are of our particular encounters, are there inserting themselves, exploiting, inserting themselves, exploiting our encounters and taxing our encounters and making that a possibility for themselves on the basis of the the forces the forces with which they regulate our encounter whether or not even we recognize these forces um be they forces you know uh behind uh um uh, a a gun you know holstered holstered as it might be on somebody's uh waist or the forces of machinery that are acting upon uh, the people that um, uh, encounter themselves in these interactions, right? So that these bankers are, after all, the gatekeepers, uh, 
that regulate uh, the traffic of exchange and transactions that we in which we find ourselves. So having said that, I want to, uh, you know, I often begin. Well, can I, can I respond or can I? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, see, so oftentimes when I would like describe to capitalism, people, I say capitalism is simply the commodification of the surplus, um, the commodification of the surplus product and the exploitation of surplus labor, right? And I, I left the question of value completely out of it because when I describe capitalism, I don't want to, I don't want to start from the point of justice or injustice. I want to start from the point of simply what it is and let the injustice emerge. The fight over justice, the fight over what is just and what is right in the world is a fight over value. That is what it's a fight over right the value of what i just did you are exploiting me you are robbing me right the value question is that's kind of like where you get robbed and where like the controlling of like how these things get produced but when we talk about the commodification surplus product what that means is the what is the necessary product the necessary product is that we all come together and we do these things necessary for all of us not to die surplus is above and beyond that so the surplus product is was above and beyond that what is surplus labor Necessary labor is the labor we come together to do to ensure that we all don't die, right? Above that is surplus labor, right? The labor that like that goes and creates, you know, this this it creates a surplus, right? The labor necessary to create the surplus, right? And so when we get into the question of value, that is that the question of the surplus value is the question of like that becomes the question of like we as individuals and the thing that mitigates the the the, the, the relationship between um the relationships between us, right? That's the this thing that exists in between the labor breaking the product, right? So that value is 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 really that's where the fight is, right? What are we gonna do in this in this terms of how are we gonna have this exchange? And why I mean like but the but but to to, to for, for us to have a revolution, for us to to abolish the system of capitalism is to abolish this kind of this 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 um this way this means of exchange that we've currently lived in our entire lives and, and our parents lived through and everyone this idea that like you know that the, that the the abolition of capitalism is going to produce a better relationship between capitalists and proletariat is not what we're talking about we're talking about the abolition of the capitalist not just capitalism the abolition of the capitalist as a role in society now, does that mean yeah. heads will roll does that mean people are going to prison does that mean they're going to be buried in shallow graves? I don't know. But what it means is that that position in society will no longer exist. You will not be able to do those things. You will not be able to be that person. That type of person is just not going to exist anymore. That role in society will not exist anymore. Like if we were like, you know, playing a game and right, you know, it's duck, duck, goose. The goose is gone, right? The goose is gone. It's just duck, duck, yeah. duck, duck, duck. You know, like that, yeah. that's what we're talking about here. So um, I think that... Um, that's really important. Like to, to talk, when we talk about like this question of value, that the value it really emerges from this question of, of of labor and product. I mean, like you know, and the commodity, you know, like the, that everything becomes a commodity. Like all the things we make, all of the, the 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 beauty and, and and interest and invention that we have as human beings that make us different than the other the rest of the animal kingdom, um, become these things that we sell to one another in the most yeah. crude, disgusting manner. We will kill each other. If we don't abide by the rule of sale right so that's what commodity is um exploitation is the fact that those who make it don't own it and and um and they're going to be paid less than what they do and that's when the question of value comes in so just to make this like really like clear and easy like yeah. for people to, to really grasp on a visceral level um that's what we're talking about here when we talk about surplus yeah um there's there are there are a lot more implications uh in this particular chapter, and in addition to the implications, there are a lot, uh, a lot, there are many more uh, things uh, that are tied to the construction of surplus value uh, that um, we simply can't get into uh, on account of, on account of you know the time constraints of our encounter, um, uh, regulated as it is by the clock, uh, and I certainly want to uh, engage uh, other folks. Uh, uh, and I'll begin uh, uh, as I as I often do uh, by responding to one of the observations uh, and questions that that San makes. He says, "Like the market, like supply and demand, which cannot produce normative outcome, discussion cannot produce truth. It can only generate more discussion. Truth becomes a mere function of the eternal competition." of opinions. How can an unending conversation generate truth? Uh, his, 
his question is a rhetorical one, obviously, and I think that we've, uh, you know, that's been the basis. Uh, you know, his his uh, contribution to our discussion today is, a, in some ways, a, a a good way of summarizing. A good way of summarizing our discussion. Dust uh, Dust uh, comments. He says, "For the proletariat need, for the proletariat need the truth, and there is nothing more harmful to its cause as plausible." respectable, petty, bourgeois lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Matt, uh, we are uh, at the close of, um, uh, we are at the close of, of our discussion. And as always, um, uh, won't you, uh, also uh, close and synthesize our discussion poetically. Sure. Well, this seems like it's kind of a call to action kind of kind of kind of moment right now. Right. So I'm going to give you a, an excerpt of a poem I'm working on. I'm give you the All first. Right. So it's not done yet, but it, it, it can serve. It can So yeah, it's not even it, happy hot yeah, off the press. Yeah, but 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 it could serve because because I write them in like acts. It, it could it could yeah. serve his own short poem. All right. Look. Okay. This is a Molotov tossed towards Camelot. This is Paradise One. The rise of the sixth sun. This is myth that is legend. A sense of direction when you can't trust your senses materially. Historic and dialectic, mysterious until it isn't. It is written. The now past, present, and future generations count seven. This is that this and that shit. That will knock it till you try it. Today's hypothesis, tomorrow's science. That which remains the same a state of constant change in a fit of rage and a jilted state in a gilded age. The spark of lights of flame in these decades made days. The risk of sounding ridiculous. It's that post-industrial proletariat spitting back through knowledge. Eat the rich. History will absolve us. That's it. <laughs> History will absolve us. All right. Wonderful. It's going to be well received. Uh, in other latitudes, particularly that quote. Uh, well, I mean, okay, well, so, so just to like break it down, that that there's history will absolve us. There's the decades made days. There's um, there's a couple things in there. You got you got you got to listen. I'm, 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 you know, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, that's also that's also in there. That's that's so got Chad right. and uh, and uh, and in there. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you as well, uh, and uh, we'll be joining next week. And remember, you know, we're 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 out here, we're out here fighting the good fight, and so we still got to think about like, uh, you know, and even in this time, the COVID's still out there, I guess. And so we got to like, you know, still keep your physical distance, but physical distance, not social distance. And just because yeah. we're locked in, or we're not really locked in anymore, but just because we're kind of locked in still, doesn't mean we have to be a locked yeah. out. Keep this conversation <laughs> going, and you know, like, and uh, and we will fight for the truth, and we will speak the truth, and after that, we'll do something else. But. We'll talk about that later. All right. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Bye-bye.